All right, some people identify quickly. Have you ever said anything worthwhile is working for? Yeah, worth working for? Absolutely. Uh, marriage is work, and we're going to begin a series on that. The problem is not that marriage is work, is sometimes that marriage feels like work and no gain. Sometimes it just feels like we work and work and work, and it stays the same. And if we're really honest, I think I can say this with some credibility with now uh, 17, 18 years of, of uh, hearing from married couples as a pastor, that there are very, very few marriages that are really thriving. There are very, very few couples in relationship with each other who are absolutely in healthy, dynamic, growing relationships with each other. And you can say, well, that's, you know, that's the ideal. That's not even possible. We're going to push on that idea a little bit. I want to I ask you to engage something. We're going to go on a pretty lengthy series here on marriage and family relationships. It's going to hit all aspects. But I want to I first hit the people today and talk to you about why you need to be here and listen and engage even if you're not married yet or if you've been married but are no longer married. So I want you to tune in for a second. The reason we need you is because our country is founded upon this basic institution called marriage. Our country is built on it. And we're only as healthy and strong as families are. And so we need you to understand whether you're married or not, whether you're not married or, or going to be married or have been married and no longer married, we need everyone here equipped with a very clear understanding of what the Bible says a good and healthy marriage should be. Because how many of you are moving towards that? Or how many of you know people today, whether you're married or single, how many of you people, people know others who are struggling or have struggled and come to you and you just don't know what to say? And a lot of times we don't know what to say because we feel like we're struggling in the very same ways the people and all that are coming to us and all we can do is commiserate with them. But what a powerful thing if you are a single today and you have a clear understanding of what the Bible says about marriage. And so when somebody does come to you, you can speak to that. When culture pushes against something and, and tries to push the envelope, you'll know where to stand. And when you look for a spouse, if you are to look for a spouse, you understand what you're moving towards and what the ideal is. This this is a series that's aimed at everyone. If you're married, you already know why you need to hear this, right? You already know uh, the question of why is this so hard? And it is. And the problem is not that it's hard, it's that we're stuck. So many marriages are stuck in a place of it being hard but not improving. It's one thing to work hard and see improvement, right? We love that. Would you love to exercise and eat right and sacrifice all the delicious food and then just not change any physically? That would be miserable, right? We're doing the same thing in our marriages. We seem to work, but we don't work right, and we don't do the right things, and we stay stuck. We stay in the same rut, and it becomes very discouraging. And it's not just for our pleasure. It's for the, and the health of our country, but also the very health of the church that God has given us to be a part of. This is an incredibly important uh, series. I have long pushed against preaching it because I don't feel qualified. But I have wrestled with God long enough to know that it doesn't matter if I'm qualified. He's qualified. And he kind of made that clear to me. So I said, okay, God, I'll say whatever you want me to say. And I'm going to tell you what, we're going to say everything the Bible says about marriages. So if it ticks you off, you just be mad at the Bible, all right? So I, if you, and, and honestly, that's kind of tongue-in-cheek. But honestly, if I say something you don't think is biblically grounded, if it's not validated through the authority of God's Word, then you have every right to come talk to me before I even leave the building. But I want you, even if you're offended, to check out the source. Don't just say, well, I don't like what you're saying. First of all, I don't like it when you get mad at me. I don't like that. <laughs> no one does. So I'm avoiding that. I'm deflecting and saying, you just get mad at God. Okay? You just get mad at God today. I, I think this is going to be amazing, quite honestly. It has been revelatory to me. I think it is one of the most exciting journeys I've taken in a long time. And I am so convinced, I am so convinced that God is going to do something amazing. I have asked our deacons, I've asked elders, I've asked everybody that got in my way. Not everybody that got in my way, but people that are close that really pray 
to pray that God would just strengthen our church, that he would protect me and my marriage right now as we, I think that we become a target when you begin to preach about marriage. There's no greater way to undermine that whole thing than to, than to have a big fight with my wife before we come to church every Sunday. And we haven't done that, so we're, not, we're praying that people keep praying and uh, that you would also be open, just wide open, to what God wants to say to you. And not what do I want him to say, but what does he want to say? And that's a big difference. You know, out of the dozens of people I've talked to over the, over the years about, about their marriages, maybe more than dozens, probably, there's a common question, and they don't always state it in these words, but it's always there, and it is, why is this so hard? And they, they can state that in a lot of different ways, out of frustration or, you know, f sense of futility, but the question is always, why in the world, out of all the relationships I have in my life, why is this one so distinctly difficult why do I pour so much into this one and get so little in return in terms of it becoming healthier and happier why is this one so hard that's a great question and I bet it's a question that most married couples have asked and if it's not it'll be one that you do ask most likely we're gonna spend several weeks looking at the answer to that question I'm telling you this is gonna be an amazing journey I have seldom had such a fulfilling and rich time preparing a message than I had this week. So I, my mother-in-law asked that question, what would I get out of it? My, Kelly's mom is single, and I answered that question the same way I told you. I, I told her, I said, we have got to be equipped to have voice into the people's lives that are around us, not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of the world and the culture around us. So if you're married, uh, you know why we need this. If you're not married, then I'm telling you it's desperate that you're armed with the truth. So here's the question for the series, why is marriage so hard? And what that means is, is why does marriage take real work to really succeed? Why does marriage take real work to really, truly succeed? And to answer that question, we have to go all the way back to the original couple and see what it was supposed to be like. All right, we have to go back and see what it was supposed to be like before everything got totally messed up by sin. So we're going to go back and get a copy of the original blueprint of marriage. We're going to go back and say, God, before we messed it up with sin, what was it supposed to look like? And here's why we're going to do that. If we don't have a clear vision and a clear aiming point for what the ideal is, what are we going to aim at? What are we trying to get better if we don't have a measure for that? And I'm guessing, I don't know this, I didn't do a Facebook poll, I hadn't talked to anybody, but my guess is most of us, I didn't, most of us don't have a clear understanding of how God originally designed this relationship to look. And it is so amazing that it will I just blow your mind away. If you'll hear what God's going to say to you, I think you're going to leave here in breathless wonder at what the original design was supposed to be like. And it is absolutely beautiful. So we're going to look at that today. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 and verses 20 through 25 as a launching point today. And it's just one part. It's kind of the focal point. It's the beginning point. And there's amazing stuff in here. I mean, I have read Genesis, I don't know how many times, but God caused me to stop and be still and to soak in some stuff that I have never soaked in before. So I'm going to have you stand in the honor of reading God's Word today, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 20. We're going to go through verse, verses 20 through 25. Let me remind you that if you don't, if you didn't bring a Bible today, we have them provided back there on the deacon's table and behind that column uh, at the back of the sanctuary. You're welcome to borrow those anytime that you would like. Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 20. The man... That's Adam. Gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he, that's God, took one of his ribs, that's Adam, and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God, I want to ask you to use your word as you've intended to. Not as we would want it, not as our preferences would allow us to go, but, but as you intend for your 
powerful, living, active, sharp word. Let it penetrate. We want to connect with you right now. We want to hear from you face to face. So just be manifest right now, God. We're desperate for you. We need this message. Help me to be clear in my communication of the truth that's here. It's in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Go ahead. All right. God created the first man, Adam, from the dust of the ground. He was made, and then God breathes life into him, and then he becomes a living being. This is just cool stuff. The chronology of this is just God creating Adam. Here's kind of how this goes. In chapter 1 of Genesis, there's a panoramic view a snapshot of, of creation, days 1 through 6. Day, day 7 comes in Genesis chapter 2. And what Genesis 2 does is it zooms in on the specific pinnacle of God's creation, that is the creation of man. It retells the story that is just basically summarized in Genesis 1 and gives us a very up-close and personal look at the formation of man and the relationship man would have with God and the relationship man would have with woman and woman would have with man. It's a, an incredible story. God creates Adam from the dust, and then in this incredible act of innocence, he breathes l the breath of life into him. He, he, he gives him life, and then it says that when he did that, that, then Adam became a living being. Not when he was formed from the dust, but when God gave him the breath of life. Adam was a part of creation, but he wasn't just a part of creation. Adam was the pinnacle of creation. Adam was the culmination of creation. Now, everything else that was created, certainly all for God's glory, Adam included, but Adam was, it was the crown jewel. And he bore the profound distinction from all the rest of creation that made him that crown jewel. And Adam, unlike any other created thing, any other created being, was fashioned in the image of God. It says that in verse 26 in the first chapter. And that means to be fashioned in the image of God fundamentally most basically means that Adam was created with the capability to have relationship with God. No other created being, no other created entity or, or, or thing could have relationship with God. Not like Adam would. Everything's subject to the reality of God's being. But not everything, in fact nothing but Adam could have the capacity to relate to and to know and to love God and be loved in return, to have a mutual exchange. So that is exactly what's at the, at the heart of what it means when Adam is created in the image of God. And then we're told that God plants a garden in the, uh, in the east, uh, in, the, in, place, uh, in a place called Eden, and that's where God intentionally placed Adam. He put him there. He placed him there. And it was created especially, especially for man. Eden was a location where Adam was designed to have fellowship with God. That was the place. That's where God and Adam would connect and have fellowship, that where their relationship would take place. And it was a place of such beauty and magnitude and splendor that you could never describe it in a thousand years with words that were given. Eden was, was all that you could imagine and much, much more when you think about paradise. So God put Eden, and every time... God put Adam in, in, in Eden, and every time I think that Adam looked up and he saw the trees and he saw the water and he saw the fields and he saw the fruit and he saw the bounty, I think he was awed every single time. You, you hearken back to that when, when, you, when you see something that's beautiful in creation, whether it's a sunset or, or the fall colors or the flowers that grow in the spring, you hearken back to that. Remember when you're arrested by some of those natural, beautiful things? It could be a mountain range. It could be standing on the, on the very cusp of the Grand Canyon. It could, be, it could be a thousand different things. But those moments when you were just awed by the beauty and the majesty of creation, that was Adam's experience. I know that you think that that sounds unsustainable. I mean, how could you live in awe? But that was, that was Adam's creation. That is paradise. And that's where he was placed. Listen, this all build, builds some, to some incredible things. In the middle of that place of paradise, um, Adam, it says, and I forgot to read the scripture. It's Genesis 2, 7 through 9. I apologize for that. But in the middle of this place, there was, a, there was two trees. And one of those was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the other one was the tree of life. Both of those trees existed in the very middle of this garden, it says. And they were and the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means that it, it contained the source of knowledge, 
from a spectrum of things, from the knowledge of everything that is good all the way to the knowledge of everything that is evil. Adam had no knowledge of, of all that. He had no knowledge of all the way, to, certainly of the spectrum of, of evil. And there existed that tree in the middle. All right, so pu push pause and let's go to the next thing. There's Adam in the garden. That's the scenario. And the next thing that Genesis tells us is that Adam is made responsible. Okay, Adam's made responsible. Look in the scriptures with me in, in verses 15 through 17. Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and he put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. He didn't just say, Sit down, Adam, check it out, and, and I'll get back to you in a thousand years to see if you're still enjoying it. Adam did not sit down and just watch. Adam was a participant. He was actually responsible in the Garden of Eden. He said to cultivate and keep it. Verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man. Here comes another responsibility, okay? The first one was to cultivate and keep it, and here's the second one. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree in the garden, Adam, anything anywhere, you may eat freely. That's the first thing God told Adam, all right? But from the tree of the, life, from the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. So here's what I want you to get out of that is that Adam was made responsible in the garden. Adam was made responsible in the garden. I want to say this especially to our teenagers, because <laughs> I have some and I want you to hear this. Responsibility is not a part of the fall, it was a part of perfection. Responsibility is not a part of the fall, it was a part of the original design. The reason we rebuff or push against and don't like responsibility is because of our fallen nature does not want to accept part of this original design. But responsibility is a beautiful thing. It's, it's part of how we should exist in relationship with God. Adam had responsibility before sin ever, ever took place in the world. Adam was put in Eden, in, in Eden to enjoy the responsibility and the work of cultivating and keeping it. Now, God gave Adam and Adam alone a very clear and very explicit blessing and instruction. Eat everything you want. Look up, Adam, and see it, all of it. It's all yours. Eat freely. Eat as much as you want. And I don't know. That, you know, that boggles my mind. In, in heaven or in paradise, do you get full? Or, you know, what's the, you just eat and it evaporates? I don't understand. But he could eat as much as he wants, which sounds like heaven to me. And I'm loving this thought because Adam apparently could just eat and eat. People ask me. Are you going to get to eat in heaven? I say, well, according to Genesis, you are. Adam was putting in, in this is the, the epitome of heaven. He said, eat all you want. There will seem no limit except just one thing, Adam. Eat everything you want, but don't eat from this one tree. Now, Adam was given that responsibility when? Before Eve was ever created. Eve was not in existence at this point. Adam was given this responsibility. I want you to mark that. Because that's really important when we're talking about what's, why is marriage so hard? That's a fundamental marking point. Adam was given the responsibility to cultivate, keep, and to obey the command of God. That was the command, don't eat. Eat everything, but don't. We still struggle with this, right? There's a thousand things as believers we can do. And God said, enjoy life. I mean, in the bounty of it. But, you know, uh, let's not steal from people. Let's not lie. Let's not cheat. Let's not be violent. And we say, well, you know, I can do all these other things. Why can't I do these things? We still have the same epic problem that Adam did. And, and, and Eve did, okay? Still struggling there. But God clearly told Adam that he could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before Eve was ever created. And then here's the second thing out of there. Death would certainly and without question come to Adam if he disobeyed. That was a promise, a guarantee from God. Mark that because that's huge. Death would certainly come. Adam, if you eat, you will certainly die. Adam, you will eat you will certainly die. You need to know those words. You need to know that story because this is, this is cumulative. You're going to die if you eat that. Now, note this. Death was a potential reality at this point. It was not a reality. Nothing had ever died at this point. Death was not a reality. It was a potential reality that could come into existence through a choice of disobedience that God did give to Adam. Death had never been experienced. In fact, it's kind of confounding because how would Adam know what death is other than obviously God can communicate really well to anybody he wants to because it never took place. Now, let's look at the next passage. 
in Genesis. Verses 20 through 25. This is awesome. Look at what Adam, look at what Adam experiences here. It says in verse 20, the man gave, I, I just read all this. We're not going to read all that, but I do want to read one more part. One part it is that in that part in verse 23, the man said, after God creates Eve, brings him to her, he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's not a literal statement, guys, okay? You don't go home and say, say um, I'm supposed to call you woman because that's what it says. It does say that literally. And we've had this debate in my life group. It hasn't worked out for so many of us. Well, I'm going to go home and say, uh, hey, today we're all referring to our wives as women. They're going to say, why? Genesis 2, chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 23 says, she shall be called woman. We're calling you woman. And we'll all have black eyes by the end of the day, except for Jeremiah. Because <laughs> he can dodge really quick. I'm teasing. Because she was taken out of man. She was taken out of man now. Follow me here. Come back. All right. What, what happens here is that God, this is just so cool. You think creation is done, right? But creation isn't done. And Adam is given the privilege of naming every living creature. God brings them before him, and he, and he names them all. And in this process, you can almost read it like God's going to go, hmm. I missed something here. Woman. Oh, I forgot to create you a woman. And that is not how this went. God knew exactly what he was doing. And in this incredible blessing, God gives Adam the privilege of finishing creation with him because he bears the image of God and nothing but our creativity, nothing like our creative and ability to create maybe shout the, de the glory and declare how much in the image we're created like God, and here's God, here's Adam, and Adam gets done naming all the creature creatures, and it's like he's looking at the Father saying there's something missing, and God's going, I know. There's something missing. And then, it's not like God says, hey, here's how I did you, and he scoops up the dust. By the way, guys, we were created out of dirt, and the woman was created of bone. I don't know what that means, but it's there. Okay, so we're dirt, they're bones. I don't know where you read out of that, but it's not like he gets the dirt and says, here's how I did you, now here's a woman. He says, ah, Adam, hang on a second. And Adam goes to sleep, and, and he takes a rib from Adam, and he fashions it into a woman. Adam wakes up from his divine anesthetic, whatever that was, and he looks at Eve and I got to tell you, we read this wrong. If we read this like this, we are mistaken. Let me read it like we typically read it. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. If you read this in the Hebrew, the emphasis here is declarative. It is beautiful. Here's how my Hebrew professor described that we should understand this. A long time ago, Dr. Ralph Smith he retired the year after I uh, got out of seminary because I think he wrote most of Hebrew. He might have wrote part of Genesis. Uh, he was an old man. <laughs> but he said, I want you to understand this. When Adam saw Eve, and this is the best way to remember this, <laughs> he didn't go, this is now woman. He went, whoa, man! And that means, whoa, man, woman. He was amazed. He was shocked. Go, guys, listen to this. When the first time Adam saw Eve, he was blown away. He couldn't believe what was standing before him. And get this, he was a part of creating it. He got to be this, this other creature, this, this culmination of, cre of, of creation called woman had now come out of Adam. And when Adam looked at her, he could not believe his eyes. And the declaration that he is making is filled with passion. It's filled with amazement. And he's totally, I'm telling you, blown away. He's like, oh, I can't believe this. I've seen every animal in creation. I've seen the mountains and the skies and the stars, but this, this is bone of my bones. This is flesh of my own flesh. And she was created as a helpmate. It means to correspond to Adam. It does not mean being subject to Adam. It means correspond to Adam. So not only does 
does God let Adam discover that creation is not complete, but he lets him, as this intimate part of completing creation, as Adam could be, he lets him be in on that. And now, standing before him is his completion. And what, what man lacked, the woman would provide, and what the woman lacked, the man would now provide, and they would be completed by each other. This is celebratory stuff. This is amazing. Adam is blown away. Adam is, is in awe. He is stunned. He has now looked eyeball to eyeball with another create, create, create creature. That's what I was looking for. Creature who is born in the image of God. Could you edit that out of the video, please? Because that's going to look really dumb. He was now looking at another creature who bore the image of God, eyeball to eyeball. And in that, get this, get this, he is seeing a reflection of who he is. So he is not only celebrating his union, but celebrating his identity and who he is as a creation of God. That is awe, awe-inspiring. He is absolutely floored. And, and we can't read Genesis with boredom ever again. In the Garden of Eden, there was this intimacy between the man and the woman that is beyond imagination. They have nothing between them, nothing physically, nothing emotionally, nothing mentally. There are no barriers. There are no in, encumbrances. And it tells, us, it tells us that they were both naked and unashamed. And I read that when I was a teenager. You're kind of back there in the youth bar going, <laughs> they said they were naked. And they were unashamed. But that says a lot more than their physical state. It, it means that there was nothing between Adam and Eve. This is so hard for us to grasp because we got all kind of baggage between us in relationships. Shame, guilt, fear of intimacy, fear of rejection, all this stuff. Just all kind of stuff. And not only are we ashamed, naked, and we, that is born and vulnerable, but we're ashamed and we carry all kinds of this stuff in our relationship. So in this moment, I want you to see that there is profound, profound intimacy. And I'm not talking physical is just part of this. Physical is just an expression of the intimacy. This is, this is deep, deep intimacy. Adam and Eve experienced complete intimacy and the enjoyment, complete enjoyment of one another without any fear. Imagine this, without any fear of rejection. Never worried, was Eve going to reject him? He never, she never worried, was Adam going to reject her? Without any slight shame, am I going to let her down? If I let her down, I've, I'm a failure because so-and-so was a failure and I've got all these problems. None of that. Or without any shred of conflict, they never had an argument until sin came. It was pure and unadulterated bliss. And if I were to take a guess, if I were just guessing, I would, I would say that most of us have not experienced a lifetime of pure and unadulterated bliss in our marriages. Not a lifetime. Moments, periods, episodes, but not a lifetime. But up in this point, that's all an Adam and Eve knew. And I'm telling you, it was, it was mind-boggling to them. We're all too familiar with the very things they that were so noticeably absent in Eden. We are intimately acquainted with shame in marriage. We're intimately acquainted with guilt in marriage. We're intimately acquainted with, with conflict in marriage. We're intimately acquainted with pride in marriage. We're intimately acquainted with evil in marriage. We are acquainted with all of the things that they knew nothing about. They knew the exact opposite of those things. There was no fear of intimacy. There was no fear of rejection. There was no guilt. There was no shame. No one has what Adam and Eve had in Eden. None of us. And they didn't have it very long. But none of us have it. But we get glimpses. We get pictures. We get sp spotlights. And we think those should be the exceptions. We don't even realize that those are a hearkening back, a reminder of, from God of this is the way it was designed. This is the way it should be. But we need to see what God intended so that we can take clear aim at it as we pursue healthier, happier, more satisfying relationships in our own marriage. Now, I'm not telling you that we can get back to where Adam and Eve were because we're not going to because we still have a sinful nature. We still live in a sinful world that's broken and messed up beyond imagination. We're not going to get there. There's still going to be shame. There's still going to be guilt. There's still going to be rejection. There's still going to be fear. There's still going to be all this lack of intimacy and all that stuff. But 
we can move from where we are to a greater degree of all of those things if and only if we have a very clear picture of what the ideal is. It is much the same as when I'm practicing archery. And they will tell you that if you're, if you're aiming at a deer, you need to pick out a hair, not the side of the deer, because if you shoot big, you miss big. If you aim small, you miss small. And here's the point there. We need to focus in on a very small ideal of perfection, the bullseye that God created so that when we miss, we only miss small. We'll never get there. We'll never reach perfection, but we can get a lot further along than we are today. We can experience much less of what we shouldn't experience and much more of what we should experience, but we can't unless we know exactly what we're missing, what we should be aiming at, what the perfection looks like. We've got to do that. Now, looking back at this picture of the original design of marriage, three things are clear. And the first thing is we've fallen and we've fallen far. We are a long ways from right here, right? Anybody disagree with that who has been married or seen a married couple? You just watch, just watch. I'm kind of vacillating on my opinion of watching sitcoms that, 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 that are parodies of marriage. But one of the things they do is they take how messed up we are in marriage today and just highlight and exploit it. They don't create problems. They just, they just make 30-minute show about the problems. So in one way, it's a study of where we are in a marriage. In another way, if you get too much of that diet and not enough of the healthy, it can actually affect your view and cause you to want to accept a very low view of marriage. So what today, we've got to start at and say, here is the ideal, this is the aiming point, this is the bullseye, this is what you should aim at, this is what it was intended to be. We've fallen and we've fallen far. Now God's design for marriage is perfect even though we aren't. His design for marriage is absolutely perfect, even though we will never be and our marriages will never be. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't aim at it, right? It never means that. And the third thing is, is it doesn't have to stay this way. Some of you are in a marriage today, probably. I don't know of you. But some of you are probably in a marriage where you're just thinking, I'm suffocating. And I'm, I'm just dying in this relationship, but I'm committed and I'm enduring and I'm going to make it. And even if it's miserable... But I'm here to tell you it doesn't have to stay that way. I've seen many marriages grow exponentially after points that looked like there was no return. I'm telling you today, I want you to hear one very clear thing. Your marriage will never be perfect, but it doesn't have to stay as broken as it is today. It can grow. It can get better. It can get more enjoyable. It can become what God wants it to become on this earth, even on this side of the fall. I guarantee you. Because God is in the business of marriage. I promise you, don't lose hope. Now, just because none of us will ever have a perfect marriage doesn't mean we shouldn't have great marriages. There are three, we're going to talk about this later, but there are three phases in marriage. This is a very general, uh, and it's not on your list, but we can either uh, exist in marriage. That is the very basic level. We can endure marriage, or we can excel in marriage. And we want to learn to move towards the point of excelling. Many people, if I were guessing, I'm not, I've not done sociological research on this, but I think most of the people I know spend a lot of time in the enduring category. I'm making it. I enjoy it sometimes, but I don't enjoy it a lot of times. I'm making it. I'm telling you that's still not where we should be today. It should be I'm enjoying it most of the time, and there are bumps along the road, and that's where we need to get. That's where we're aiming at. Now, here's God's original design. I'm going to summarize this, and we're going to be done in just a second. Here's, here's everything, because what we said is, if we're going to get better in our marriages and discover why this is so hard and move ahead from that point, we have to know the ideal. We have to know what it was intended to be. And here's kind of a description of that, because there's not, there's not you know, three points. So this is an overall description. The original design was characterized by mutual respect, admiration, and love. Adam and Eve shared mutual respect, reciprocated, mutual admiration. They, they thought each other was cool. I mean, Eve did the same thing when she saw Adam that I said Adam saw it. Said, I mean, she just said man, and he said whoa man, and, and they loved each other, and they were admiring each other and just thought each other was the greatest thing in the world. And they shared mutual love for one another. They also had shared responsibility and clearly defined roles of equal value 
as Adam was charged with leadership and Eve was charged with being a helpmate or come alongside of, of Adam. And that word helpmate I'm going to define over and over again in its original context means cor, cor, one who is corresponding to, not one who is subject to, but one who is, that is lesser than, but one who corresponds to. They shared a sense of equal value as individuals. Eve did not have a lesser sense of value before God than Adam. When Adam stood before God, he sensed his value. And when Eve stood before God, she sensed her inherent value as individuals. There was not a lesser of those values. They both bore the image of God. They were both equally valuable to him and loved by him. They shared complete trust in the absence of every form of fear. They had a total sense of completion in their relationship with each other and with God. Adam and Eve lacked nothing together. They felt complete and whole and satisfied in their relationship with each other and with God. It was more of a triangle picture that together they connected with each other and with God. And then they shared profound intimacy at every level, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and physical. Here's our challenge. This is what I want you to do today because that's, that's the big picture. But I want you to make a commitment. And I'm going to ask you to do this with all sobriety and not lighthearted. In fact, if you're not really going to take it seriously, don't worry about trying it because it's not, it's not anything you should just fake. But in the next seven days, I want to ask every husband in this room, every husband that would listen on the Internet, to take your wife on a resolution date. And a resolution date is this. It's very simple. It's a date in which, one of you, in which both of you resolve to come to a solemn commitment, covenant together to do whatever it takes to have the best marriage possible. That's all I'm asking you to start with. It's just to get together, look eyeball to eyeball on a date where you're alone, you're not with kids, not with others, you're just eyeball to eyeball, and you say, you know what? I'm making a commitment to you, and I don't even know what it all means, but I'm making a commitment that I'm going to do whatever it takes to have the best marriage I can have with you, and the best one I can have is great. God does not want you to settle for less than a great and satisfying marriage. And all we're asking you to do is to resolve to do everything he asked you to do to get to that point. So we're providing a, a mari uh, making my marriage better resolution. We're going to hand that to you on the way out. I'm going to get a volunteer. I forgot to recruit somebody, so I'll get somebody to stand back there with me to hand out this little green card. I want every husband and every wife to take one themselves and sign that and make that commitment. Part of that commitment is I want you to be here the next five out of six services. It's not because one of them is irrelevant, but I think that every time I say six out of six, that puts too many pressure on people and they bow out. <laughs> okay, Five out of six, and here's why. Here's why. We're going to do nothing but the most important parts of marriage. And I'm not going to waste your time. I'm not going to hit the fluff. We're going down deep into the Word of God to look at marriage, what's wrong and how to fix it and what it looks like today. And you need to be here. You just simply do. If you miss one, please listen to it on the Internet. Go check that out. You can listen to it all, all, with, just, with just sound. You don't have to watch me again. But you can go listen to that audibly, okay? I wouldn't watch me if I were you. Part of that resolution is to do that. Now, there are those in our congregation that are not married, and, and maybe you don't even intend on getting married, and, and that's fantastic. The Bible says that's great. There's nothing wrong with that, no shame in that, nothing at all. But here's what I want to ask you to do. But I also want to ask all of us to participate in this point. This is not just for those who are single. But I want you to, to, to make a resolution, a commitment to pray for two marriages in this church family over the next six weeks, to pray regularly throughout the week that God would speak to and revolutionize and equip and bring health to at least two married couples. Now here's a, stick, stick, here's a, a stipulation. I want you to talk to them. If you're committing to pray for somebody, I want you to go tell them, I'm committing to pray for you. And we have some sheets of paper. I'm not sure I printed out enough of those, but we have some sheets of paper that you can sign and give to those folks that you're praying for them, or you can keep it yourself. It doesn't matter to me. It's not about show. It's not about who knows what, but it is about making a commitment. Now, on that prayer part, I want you to be real. In, in, uh, in other words, they need to know you're praying for them because you, if you're being prayed for, I want you to be willing to share how, you can, how that person can pray for you, what they can pray for you. So it, this is good, especially in life groups. 
to get together and, and to correspond those prayer and become vulnerable, be a little bit more authentic, and, and to take that envelope a little bit closer to the edge of the table and being authentic and, and real with people. Now, here's the other parts that we need people to do. Uh, when you're going to go out on a date, especially as young couples, you might have a lack of babysitting supply. And so if you're willing to babysit, I want you to, uh, I'm going to show you how to make yourself known to that and avail yourself to that because we need a list of volunteer babysitters. Volunteer, not paid. Volunteer, not paid. And then the second thing we need are people who would say, I will sponsor somebody's date because many, many people in our economy today cannot afford a $30 date. It's hard to go out on any kind of date unless you eat at Taco Bell and that's not a great place to make a marriage resolution, okay? So if we can get $30 sponsors to say, I will give $30, for a couple to go out, you can adequately eat at a very, you know, at a peaceful restaurant for $30. We're not trying to lavish luxury on people, but we don't want you to have to eat off the dollar menu at McDonald's either. Okay? So if you're willing to do the babysitting or the sponsoring, I want you to call or email Dwayne Dale. His information, his contact information is on your listening guide, is it not? Is that right? It's supposed to make it there. Is it on your listening guide? Somebody tell me. All right, thank you. A lot of people are like, what's a listening guide? I don't know. It's the thing you're supposed to guide your listening. Apparently you're not using it. <laughs> that was funny. I don't care what you think. <laughs> I make myself laugh even when I don't make other people laugh. Ask my wife. I want you to let him know. He has agreed. He knows that you're going to call. And so you, three people could be calling, okay? I need babysitting. I need sponsoring. I need both. Or I'm willing to babysit, and I'm willing to sponsor. Everybody go, and if Dwayne gets overflowed, he will spread this out to other elders or deacons, okay? But we would love for this to take place, and we want to make every chance possible and available to you. Listen, marriage is important, and we need healthy marriages in the church. And if we don't have healthy marriages in the church, then we don't have a healthy church. And if we don't have healthy churches, our, our country begins to decline even at a, at a greater, well at the rate that it's declining, okay? So I've told you long before, the answer isn't in Washington. The answer's not in November. The answer begins right here, really, with our culture. And so it's vitally important that you kids pray for your parents' marriage. I mean, pray for mom and dad. Don't just pray that they could survive. Pray that they could show you a shining example of how to love each other. Grandparents, pray for your grandkids. Aunts and uncles, pray for your spouse's uh, or for your spouse's family and for extended family, pray for marriages. Let's go do that right now. God, we ask you to bless. We ask you to give us your wisdom and your guidance. And we ask for a powerful move in this congregation and our marriages. That we would move from existing to enduring to excelling. And you would help us to have the healthiest relationships with our spouse that we've ever seen. Guard us as a congregation, Father. We no doubt become a target for the enemy and surround us with prayer, cause prayer, prayer warriors to rise up in our congregation to put a great hedge of protection around us so that we can move through this series without inhibition, without great conflict, and without the evil invasion that would certainly want to come and disrupt what you're doing here. And so speak through your word. Let there be clarity from your word. Let there be great movement in, in terms of moving towards greater marriages than ever before. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, today, the greatest relationship you're ever, ever going to have, the only way you can possibly have a good marriage to another person is to be united to your God first and foremost. The only way you'll ever be united to your God is to turn away from a sinful nature that we're going to look at very soon in a, in a pretty comical but a very serious way at the same way. And to turn from that sinful nature and to turn to the one who has never sinned at all, Jesus Christ, and decide and as an act of your will that you will walk and follow him through the rest of your life as you turn your back on sin. Sure, you're going to fail, you're going to mess up, but your heart has got to pledge allegiance to Jesus. First and foremost, that's how a disciple is born. And if you've never done that, we want to help you do that. Certainly, you can indicate that on your worship tear-off. You could come down here during this time of response and tell me. You could tell a friend, an elder, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, or a leader in our church. But somehow, some way, make that decision known that you're deciding to follow Jesus. If you've got questions about that, we would love to talk to you. Please indicate that 
on your worship tear off as well. Let me pray, then we're going to stand and sing. Father, we want to respond, and we want to respond obediently right now. So give us the ability and the freedom to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and do that.